as, as a society, we've been basically groomed into this world where we give up all personal responsibility in everything we do. Uh, we have organizations that, that treat us like children that hold our hands. Every, every aspect of our lives, our hands are held. To me, Bitcoin and the greater open source movement is about a move back to personal responsibility. And so this idea of self-custody is, is radical personal responsibility. It's, it's you holding um, your wealth yourself uh, without a third party. That is not really possible outside of Bitcoin. You can hold you know, gold coins, gold bars. Um, you can hold precious metals. Uh, obviously, if you have cash under your under your mattress, I'm I'm sure your audience is aware that ultimately you're you're holding an IOU that is controlled by someone else. So I don't really think you can self custody fiat. Um, so Bitcoin is 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 a is essentially is a paradigm shift, but it's a paradigm shift back to the way it used to be, which is radical personal responsibility. I just spent a lot of time uh, teaching ranchers how to use Bitcoin. And, you know, ranchers, farmers get it. These small family farms, like they've only lived in a world of radical personal responsibility. They never left it. Um, their whole life is, is, is in their hands. Um, and every decision they make is a make or break decision. So, so to me, the, the, the fundamental value prop of Bitcoin is this self-sovereignty aspect. Um, and you do not achieve that if, if you are asking permission or if you're trusting someone else to, to hold your Bitcoin for you. Yeah, um, and I think the, you're very correct on this different approach of uh, responsibility because the way that the current monetary system, the fiat monetary system works is that effectively it's all uh, pretend money. You know, everybody's dealing with pretend money and everything is uh, pretend until the central bank signs off of it. And at any point in time, the central bank can come and basically change anything. You know, they can go back to your bank and can take things out because of something you did months ago. Um, so in, effectively, it's a, uh, it's a loyalty scheme. It's a loyalty uh, points scheme for government where, um, you know, if you play along nicely, if you are politically on the right side, you get to keep your, uh, uh, you know, your coins, your fake monopoly money to play in this game. And, and of course, these are constantly also being devalued through inflation. So I think... Um, you know, part of the reason that people have a hard time understanding how a free market economy works is because money is so divorced from being um, a method of communicating how a market works, because money is this make belief <laughs> system of points, you know, you know, that um, what's that TV show? Um, Whose line is it anyway? So uh, um, the lines are made up and the points don't matter. That's basically fiat, you know, it's uh, <laughs> government can make up any points at any point in time. And, you know, anybody can become rich or uh, poor, regardless of what they do um, in terms of producing value to society, but just by being uh, politically loyal. And so the result of this is that people just don't understand how money actually works. And they think that this is why, you know, those anti-capitalist, anti-market ideas become so popular because people see all around them, people who are not productive end up with a lot of money and people who are productive end up with little money. And it's all because it's a fake system of money. And, you know, you might not like um, initially the um, added responsibility of handling your own uh, Bitcoin. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the, the downside of it is that you end up with a system where somebody else basically holds everybody's money, uh, not just yours. And then you live in a society in which work is divorced from money eventually. Yeah, I mean... I, it's it's easy to get overwhelmed uh, when you enter the Bitcoin space. Uh, one of the the number one things I tell people is, you know, we we were all there at some point when we got in. You you don't want to you don't want to get discouraged. You don't want to. It's 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 not all or nothing. It's not um, something that happens. You know, with a flick of the wrist, one morning you wake up and you decide like I'm going to be self sovereign and I have to do like all the steps. Um, you know, to be as radically self-sovereign as possible. Uh, what I say to people is, you know, dip, dip your toes in. If, if you feel more comfortable holding Bitcoin with a financial institution, uh, that's completely reasonable. It comes with its own trade-offs. I mean, you're trusting them with complete control of, of, of this asset, arguably the most scarce asset we've ever seen in our lifetimes. 
and will ever see. Um, but that is a trade-off you're making. There's, there's no rule that says, you know, you have to do a hundred percent of one or a hundred percent of the other. What I say to people is, you know, in the beginning, you know, get your feet wet, store some of it in a self-sovereign way, you know, fine, keep some with, with a, uh, with a regulated institution that, that hopefully you trust and you've, you've done some research on them. Um, and then over time, you will naturally end up in a situation where you're not going to want to keep uh, your Bitcoin with, with these institutions. There is a, there is a mindset shift that happens once you start to get familiar and more comfortable with using Bitcoin in a sovereign way. And it makes interacting with every other asset, interacting with bureaucracies, financial institutions seem incredibly antiquated. It makes it almost you have this mindset shift where to me it's more overwhelming more stress inducing uh more mentally taxing uh to not have sovereignty over my funds and to have to ask permission to have to remember passwords and sign in and hope that there's not another kyc check or hope that the website's not down or hope that the bank hours are are not closed and that the phone lines are working at their antiquated institution that they set up all the infrastructure in the 70s. Like that to me becomes the stressful part rather than actually holding my own keys. And that just comes with comfort, that comes with time, that comes with practice uh, and getting used to, to, to how, all this, how all this works. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I should say that, um, you know, for anybody listening, you know, make your own mind up, don't take any of this as gospel, because uh, there are risks and trade offs involved with everything. So there is a there's a recent trend of people saying, you know what, um, noobs can't handle their own private keys, private keys are not for grandmas, and uh, they're not for your um, average user, therefore, you know, shadowy super coders in their, uh, in their hoodies in the dark working on laptops. And, th and you shouldn't really put serious money in something like that, because you can't handle your private key. And while, you know, I, I, I could sympathize with that, that yeah, I can imagine, you know, I know people that would have trouble handling um, private keys or, or don't have the ability to do them, perhaps, but I think, you know, that doesn't mean that all the other alternatives don't involve risks. And so the question you need to ask yourself is, what are the risks involved with everything? Because there's no, there's no magic bullet. You know, this is the kind of fiat thinking where opportunity cost doesn't exist and real trade-offs don't exist, where we just press a button and then the problem is solved. You know, just give your money to an exchange and then the exchange will keep you safe. It doesn't work that way. If you're trusting your exchange, that means they're in a position to be able to take advantage of you and all the many people that are uh, trusting them. And not just, you know, the company itself, but also... Um, actors within the company or actors from outside the company. You have to worry about getting SIM swapped. You have to understand what a SIM swap is and you have to make sure that you don't do it, do it because hundreds or maybe thousands of people have been SIM swapped out of their uh, Bitcoins on exchanges. So risks exist everywhere. And I think, you know, um, you know, Matt is, is not out there telling people, you know, you have to do this. It's, it's more about here are the um, drawbacks and the benefits of these different ways. And this is the case for self storage, you know, the case is that ultimately, it's a very low time preference thing in that you put in the work early on, you figure out how to keep your Bitcoin safe. And then that's it. And then that's, you know, it, it just sits there. It, you make the investment initially, and then you don't have to spend your lifetime asking for permission and worrying about all these other attack vectors from outside, um, other than the ones that you can control. I like I like that you highlighted that everything does has trade offs. And um, I think that is key. I mean, a good uh, rubric, I think, when entering the space is as you're learning, as you're going down the rabbit hole, constantly ask yourself, what are the trade offs and ask others, what are the trade offs? And if they tell you there are no trade offs, frankly, they're completely full of shit. And that should yeah. be a red flag for you because everything everything does have trade offs. And to me, a vibrant, robust Bitcoin ecosystem is one where Bitcoiners have many different options with many different trade-offs. They're able to assess those risks themselves and, and choose the trade-off balances that, that best suit them. Um, and a perfect example here is, is in between self-custody, holding your keys yourself, and trusting an institution with your keys. Services like Unchained Capital, for instance, 
uh, do something called collaborative custody. And, and that's something that's only possible with Bitcoin. You can't do that with precious metals. You can self custody precious metals, but you can't do collaborative custody. And the idea there is when it comes down to Bitcoin, you have something called private keys. The private keys are what allow you to spend your Bitcoin. Um, we also have a concept called multi-sig, which means you need multiple private keys. Uh, you basically need multiple keys to spend that Bitcoin. And these collaborative custody options, uh, you, you trust the institution with your privacy, but they can't spend your Bitcoin uh, without the key that you hold. Um, and you can use their key if you lose one of your keys. So it's, it's a shared custody model. Uh, where you're not trusting them with actually with actually your funds, they can't steal your money, but you are still trusting them with your privacy. And it's, that's a nice middle ground, I think, for people, especially high net worth individuals, as they're starting to get their feet wet in the in the personal responsibility side.